morning. Good morning. Welcome to Our Savior. We are so glad to have each and every one of you here with us today. We know we have guests and visitors here. We're glad you're here. We pray that this time is a blessing. All that you need for worship can be found up on the screen. We invite you to sing along, follow along, fully participate with us this morning. A few quick announcements as we get going today. Coming up on October the 10th, the youth are going to be hosting a golf tournament. If you're a golfer, or maybe you're someone who pretends to golf, uh, either way, we'd love to have you come out and join, join us for that. Registration is up and going online. If you need more information on that, I invite you to stop and talk to Sarah. Coming up next week, we are beginning something new. It's going to be a family Bible experience geared especially for kids and parents to come together. It's going to be on Sunday mornings, the last Sunday of the month, and then on Sunday evenings, the first uh, Sunday of the month. So next Sunday, 1030, we'd love to have all the parents and kids join together for a morning of fun and time in God's Word together. And then the following week, October the 3rd, 4045 to 545 with dinner right before family worship. We'd love to have you guys join us for that. We continue with Wednesdays in the Word, both in person and online, 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights. We'd love to have you join us. This week, we're going to be reminded of the maker of all those famous chocolate chip cookies, a guy by the name of Amos. We would love to have you come and join us uh, uh, for Wednesday night in the Word. Uh, we have a new sermon series beginning next, uh, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that, October the 3rd. A series called How to Be an Encourager. We're going to be looking at the life of a guy by the name of Barnabas. You're going to want to be here. You're going to want to be a part of it. Excited for that new series. And then also on October the 3rd, we're going to have Blessing of Quilts. Uh, we have some quilters here at Our Savior who have been busy this year making a lot of beautiful quilts. And we look forward to celebrating those and uh, blessing those as they get ready to be sent out around the world. Next Sunday, we're starting a new Sunday morning study, uh, taking a look at how, how do we as Christians look at Islam? And we're, we're going to spend 12 weeks a, taking a look at that, something very uh, timely in the world that we live in right now. So Jesse Al is going to be helping us walk through that Sunday mornings at 1030 as a part of our Sunday morning study. That feels like a mouthful. But with that said, let's stand as we sing our opening hymn, Awake My Soul and With the Sun. May God bless your worship.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Delight yourself in the Lord. Friends, as we prepare to come before God and confess our sins, giving him each and every one of our sins, we take a moment of silence to ready our hearts and minds. Let us now confess our sins to God our Father. Friends in Christ, by grace you are known and loved by the one eternal God, who wills all that is best for you. Through the suffering, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, he has brought about the forgiveness of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ who sets us free, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord strengthen you with power through his life-giving spirit, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
us pray. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. The Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 28 through 29, and chapter 16, verses 13 through 17, and can be found on pages 158 and 160 of your pew Bible. At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow, who are within your towns, shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. You shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days, when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your winepress. You shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep this feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 25, and can be found on page 984 of your pew Bible. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. This is the word of the Lord. Stand if you are able for the reading of our, our Holy Gospel. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, and can be found on page 811 of the Pew Bible. 
Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for, he will either, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now join in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father.
grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who am I? And what am I here to do? Two huge questions, right? Who am I? And what am I here to do? And how we go about answering those two questions will have a dramatic impact on not only how we see ourselves, but how we live out each and every moment of our lives. Who are you? Friends, you are more than the sum of the grades that you make on your report card. You are more than the sum of your accomplishments. You are more than the sum of the trophies hanging on your wall or on your nightstand. Who are you? You are more than the number of friends that you have or the number of the friends you don't have. You're more than the sum of the number of friends you have in real life or the number of friends you have on Facebook. Who are you? You are more than the clothes in your closet, the clothes that you wear, the accessories that you accessorize with, or the shoes that are on your feet. Who are you? You are more than the circumstances that you will face, the family that you were born into, the house that you live in, or the car that you drive. Who are you? You are more than the mistakes that you will make, the shortcomings in your life, the pain that you experience, and the mistakes that you will make. Who are you? You are more than the parent of your child. Who are you? You are more than the job that you have, or the title that's on your desk. For friends, we live in a world that loves to put labels on absolutely everything. Labels that seek to define us, labels that seek to tell us who we are, whether we are rich or poor, young or old, pretty or ugly, smart or not smart, bald or hairy, fat or skinny. And these labels just keep coming and coming and coming, and it's the world's way of saying, let me tell you who you are and what you're supposed to be, but also what you're supposed to do. But in all of these labels, and all of these descriptions of who we are, there's one word that I see that we're missing. There's one name that I see that we're missing. Jesus. For this morning, instead of grounding us in who the world says that you are, I want to ground you in who Jesus says that you are. And what the Bible has to say about who you are. Who are you? You are God's beautiful and amazing masterpiece. Friends, you are God's handiwork. You are God's beautiful creation. You were knit together in your mother's womb by the hands of the Almighty that made the Grand Canyon and the Aardvark. You were fearfully and wonderfully made by the creator of the universe who spoke everything into being. You are created purposely and beautifully by God. You are God's handiwork in process. You are God's masterpiece in the making. Who are you? You are loved. You are loved. Not in the way we love our favorite sports team. Not in the way we love tacos or burritos or whatever your favorite food is. But you are loved with a love that isn't here today and gone tomorrow. You are loved with a love that's higher than the heavens, deeper than the seas, wider than the oceans. You could spend the entirety of your life seeking to come to the end of and find the depth of this love. And you will never find the end of it because it has no end for friends you are loved by God who are you you were desired 
you were desired. In a world where at times we can feel all alone, where in times we can feel like the odd man out, where we can feel insignificant and like no one would notice if we weren't there, God's words to you are, you are desired. You are so desired that Jesus would give up heaven to come and be with you. For Jesus gave up heaven, all the glory, all the majesty, all the awesomeness of heaven to enter into our lives, to enter into our world, to enter into history, to enter into our story, to come on a mission to seek and to save the lost. But to say that isn't enough, because we have to make it personal, he came on a mission to seek and to save you. Because the thing that he desired more than anything else was for you to be his own. So much so that on a day we call good, on a hill we call Calvary, he would lay down the life of his own son and die. Because when he looks at you, he sees someone worth dying for. And he desires for you to be his own. Friends, you aren't just God's masterpiece. You aren't just loved. You aren't just desired. But you are forgiven you are forgiven no matter what sins that you've made no matter what mistakes that you've done no matter what you've done no matter how big or small no matter how public or private the deepest darkest things that you try to hide from everyone around you in Jesus each and every one of your sins has been forgiven in the eyes of God you are forgiven and you are holy But even more than that, you are God's child. You are God's child. You are a prince or a princess of the king and kings and lord of lords. In a world where sometimes we wonder, do I belong here? Does anyone else want me around? God says, you are mine. You are my family. You're a part of this house. You're my kid. And friends, this is who God says that you are. You are created by him. You are desired by him. You are loved by him. You are forgiven by him. And you are his child. Don't believe me? Let's take God's word for it. Here's how Peter puts it. 1 Peter chapter 2. Read for me these words in red. But you are a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you, we are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now... What does Peter say about you? Don't, don't, don't listen to me, listen to God. What does he say? You are chosen. God chose You, not like a game of kickball where you're playing recess and you get down to the very end and there's that one kid left and and everyone's going, I don't want him. And someone goes, well, I guess you're the last one left, so I'll take him. That's not how God chose you. God chose you before the foundation of the world. God, knowing you, knowing your foibles, knowing your warts and your stinkiness too, God chose you on purpose to be his. He has made you holy. He has made you his priesthood so that the world might know him through you. Think about that. God's desire for you is that the world might know Jesus through you. You're the instrument. You're the vehicle. You're the one through which he says, I want others to know me through you. Once you didn't belong, but now you do belong. You're a part of the family. For you are one who has received mercy. Don't believe Peter. Don't believe me. Well, how about Paul? Colossians chapter 3. Here's how he puts it there. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Who are you according to Paul? Chosen, right? Not in this I'm stuck with you kind of way, but in the God chose you kind of way. Holy. Why? Why? Because of what Jesus did on the cross, he said, I'm not going to let your sin, I'm not going to let your mistakes, I'm not going to let your past define who you are. But through the blood of Jesus, you have been made perfect. You have been made holy. 
And you are his beloved. And you are never going to be able to come to the end of the depths of God's love for you. And, you're, and some of you are going, Pastor, you've repeated yourself like three times. Yes, I know. Some of you are sitting out there going, dude, Pastor, just get, get on with it already. We already know this. But friends, we live in a world that's constantly trying to tell us who we are. We live in a world that's constantly trying to immerse us and say, let me define you. Let me tell you who you are, what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to act, how you're supposed to think, how you're supposed to love, how you're supposed to relate. And friends, if I have an hour a week with you, I am going to immerse you in the reality of here's who God says that you are. Because we need to be reminded again and again and again and again. Because I go back to those two questions, right? Who am I and what am I here to do? Because if we lose sight of who we are in Jesus, then what we're going to hear next in the book of Colossians is nothing more than just another to-do list. Another list of do this, don't do that. But if we read these words through the lens of Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us and who he says that we are, it's not just a to-do list. It says, here is how we live out this identity that God has placed upon us in his son. For friends, as we go and we look at this list, whether it's Paul's list, holy, chosen, beloved, whether it's Peter's list, chosen race, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, the ones who God has his, our picture on his refrigerator or my list you are god's beautiful creation you are desired you are loved you are forgiven you are god's child i don't care which list you look at all of those things are true because we are truly blessed by god and as we think about this idea of blessing, we always have to think of it not as something we've earned, not as something that we've made a reality, but something that comes from outside of us, comes from an outside force, comes from God's work in our lives. And as people who are blessed, and if all these things that we've said are true, are, we are truly blessed, then what does it mean to live a life flowing out of the blessings of God in our life. And for that, I want to turn back to the words of Paul. Colossians chapter 3. Let's take a look. Colossians chapter 3. Let's go back to verse 12. And here it goes. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let me ask this question. Does who we are matter? And if who we are matters, does it then begin to have an effect on what we do? Absolutely. And did you notice how everything that he says in this list of, here's how I want you to live, flows out of God's work in our lives? As ones who have been chosen, as ones who are holy, as ones who are beloved, he says, put on then compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Why? Because we've already received those things from God. How many of you have been a parent? How many as a parent have ever had to practice patience? How many of you can imagine the patience that God has to practice with us? Right? To have a God who's been incredibly patient with us, even though we go our own way, we do our own thing, we say, no, I want to do it my way. And God says, don't do it. Oh, he did it again. And yet a God who's incredibly patient with us, he says, put on patience because we're going to deal with a bunch of knuckleheads in our lives. Amen? 
And as we're dealing with not knuckleheads, what's it going to take? Patience. It's bearing with one another in forgiveness, just as God has forgiven us. Notice the foundation, right? It isn't forgive them because they're worth it. It's forgive them because, well, God's had to forgive you a lot. And love one another because we've learned from God this is what love is. Not the love that we see in this mushy-gushy rom-com kind of way. Not a love that's here today or gone, to not, gone tomorrow. Not a love that's, well, I feel it in my gut because I get butterflies when I'm around you. But a love that says you're worth dying for. And he keeps going in. He says, well, I want you to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts because God's peace comes into our lives and it says no matter where we go, no matter what we face, we know the end of the story, right? And on the last day, guess who wins? God wins. So you can take my life, you can take my stuff, you can take my freedom, you can take all this stuff, but you can't take away the end of the story. And that's what it looks like to have the peace of Christ rule in our We're people of the word, people who come to God's word and says, we believe that this is a living and active word. We live and move and breathe and have our being in this word so that it begins to shape the way that we think. It shapes the way that we speak. It shapes the way that we live, the way that we love, the way that we relate. We gather and we have thanksgiving and worship together so that, going back to verse 17, what does it say? And whatever you do in word or deed, do some things... Is that what it says? But in everything, what's included in everything? Everything. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Friends, as I read these words, I can't help but think of a story of a young boy. A young boy whose name was Johann. His parents died at a young age, and there's a story of him when he was about 10 years old. It was a dark and stormy night. And led only by candlelight, he snuck out of his room, and he loved stormy nights because there was noise going on outside. And he could sneak out of his room, and he knew which boards not to touch in the floor. And he could sneak down the hall and into his brother's study. For you see, he was being raised by his brother after his parents died, and his one passion in life was music. And his brother was a church organist. And so he was teaching young Johann how to play music. And Johann loved music, but he had a problem with his brother because his brother said, music is serious business and the thing of adults, and you can learn the basics, but you can't learn anything else. And this drove Johann nuts because he wanted to grow and learn and learn and learn and learn and learn. And so under the cover of darkness on this dark and stormy night, he snuck down the hallway, he creaked the door open just right to make sure it didn't make any sounds to wake his brother up, and he went into his brother's study where he found all of his brother's music. And note by note, he began to copy down on a piece of paper the music that his brother was playing so that he could go back to his room and begin to practice. And he began to practice and practice and practice to the point that by the time he turned 17, he had become a good enough musician that he was hired by a Lutheran church to be their church organist and their church choir director. He liked to tell people that I play the notes on the page, but God's the one who makes the music. And he loved to share his passion, his joy of music with all of God's people. But one day his pastor came to him, and I know that this will be a shock to all of you because this would never happen in a church ever. Someone came to the pastor and complained. I know that's a shock. And the pastor came to Johan and said, we've had a complaint about your music. Some people think it's too fancy. Some people think it's too loud. Some people think it's taking away from the focus off of God. And so, Johan, we're going to have to fire you. Johan was heartbroken. Because he tried to do everything he did to lead people into a heart of worship. He tried to use all of his music to be an outpouring of his thoughts, the emotions. And it was an act of worship to God. And yet, I have to tell you that this wasn't the end of the career of Johan. But he continued to make music. He continued to write music. 
And every time he came to the end of the piece, he would write three letters at the bottom of the last page. S-D-G. Those three letters stood for three Latin words. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. For for Johann, when he would sit down to write music, it was all for the glory and honor of God. I want you to hear the way he described this reality. These are the words of Johann Sebastian Bach. Here's what he said. The main purpose of my music is to glorify God. Some people do this with music that is simple. I have chosen to use a simple style, but my music comes from my heart as a humble offering to God. This honor God honors God no matter what musical style I use. Jesus, help me show your glory through the music I write. May it bring you joy, even as it brings joy to your people. For here's what Bach understood. When Paul is speaking these words, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, and he says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He's not just talking about the professional Christians, whatever those are. He's not talking about just those who are uber-religious. He's not just talking about those who are old or those who are young or those who are middle-aged or those who are still working or those who are retired. He's talking about everyone. He's saying in everything we do, we do it for the glory and honor of God. Now check out where Paul goes next, Colossians 3, 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. In other words, does this go into the realm of our marriage? The kind of spouse we are, the way that we love our husband, the way that we love our, our wife, flows out of our worship of God and who God says that we are. But notice the next relationship it goes into. Children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, let them, lest they become discouraged. In other words... It's the parent-child relationship. The kind of parent we are flows out of who God says that we are. We do it for God. The kind of child we are flows out of our relationship with God. Then we hear one, one more. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Some of you are going, Whew, I don't have to listen to this one. Stop for a second. How many of you have ever had a job? How many of you have ever had a boss? How many of you have ever had a teacher? You've had a boss. Right? He's talking to you, and he's saying, we're going to work in such a way that we're working for who? For God. Not trying to please them, but we're doing everything we do because they could be a terrible, horrible, no good, dirty, rotten scoundrel, but we're going to be the best worker we can because we're seeking to give glory and honor to Right? And then he brings it all together, verses 23 and 24, and I'll stop here, I promise. Whatever you do, hear those words again. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Two questions, right? Who am I? And what am I here to do? If we begin to listen to the world and we begin to take Jesus out of the equation, everything we've just heard from Paul makes absolutely no sense. But if we begin to hear ourselves and see ourselves through the lens of Jesus and who Jesus says that we are, what Paul said right there makes a lot of sense. We do everything for the glory and honor of God, seeking to serve an audience of SDG, right? Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Will you pray with me? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible love for us. We thank you that you're the God who not only made us, but desires us and wants us to be your own. We thank you that you're a God who loves us so much that you would lay down your life for us. We thank you that in you we are forgiven and have new life. We thank you that we get to be your kids. 
And Lord, when everyone else is trying to tell us who we are or what we are, help us to see ourselves through the lens of you. And help us today, tomorrow, and always to live out that identity that you've placed on us. In the way that we speak, in the way that we love, in the way that we relate, in the way that we're spouses, in the way that we're parents, in the way that we're kids, in the way that we're workers, in everything that we do. Help it to flow from what you have done for us. Lord, as we gather here today, we pray for those in our midst. Lord, there's some who come here today just struggling. Lord, you know who they are. You know what's going on. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give healing, strength, perseverance, peace. There's those in our midst who are sick. And, Lord, we ask for your healing touch. Throughout your many ministry, you healed many with ill and diseased bodies. And just as you healed them, we ask that you would heal now. Lord, we pray for our community pray that you would bring peace. We pray that you'd bring us together and that you would help us to be your light where you would place us. All these things we bring before you and we now pray the prayer that you're teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Stand with me as we ready our hearts and minds to receive God's gifts and communion. Friends in Christ, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection has assured us a divine peace through the forgiveness of the sinful warning of our passions, passions and ambitions. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. in Christ, it's with thanksgiving that we remember how our Lord Jesus Christ, on the very night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Come, for the table of the Lord is now ready. Welcome. Christ, now may this very body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Go now in his peace and joy and serve the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in the sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Friends, we are truly blessed, right? We are God's amazing handiwork, God's masterpiece in process. We are desired, we are loved, we are forgiven, and we belong to him. And as his people, loved and adored by him, I now send you forth with this love. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and fill you with his perfect peace. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing our closing hymn.